It's another week and we are back. Welcome back to the It's More Than Just Money movement channel. And as you know, every single Monday we bring you amazing people that are doing amazing things. Well, we always say in South Africa and globally, but this time it looks like it's in Ghana, UAE, South Africa and globally. Uh, welcome to the winner's circle. You know that on this subset of the channel, we basically have amazing conversation conversations with people that are amazing and that one person that we're having today is Kwame, <laughs> futurist Kwame. Yes sir. You know I would go into reading out your 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 biography or your profile <laughs> but that profile man is this thing I you, think you, I've spent you, the entire you shouldn't. <laughs> going, going through that and one makes what one begins to wonder when did it all start right and and one wonders what your story actually is you yeah. know i always say that i'm more interested in the story more than the glory Absolutely. because a lot of people when they see people like you doing amazing things they focus on the results yeah but behind those results behind that story cool. behind that glory there's a story yes sir yeah yes sir so what's your story um it, it, wow so first of all thank you for having me um I, I saw a few episodes uh, before coming on here and I think you're building an amazing thing. So congratulations and, and thank you for availing your vessel for, um, you know, value to be communicated. Oftentimes we underestimate the power of the platforms that we invest so heavily into to create uh, and how it benefits other people. Sure. Uh, if you understand the power of the internet and the fact that the internet never forgets. Uh, mm. There are generations on born that might see some of the stuff you've created and it will change their lives. And that's the power of what you've, you've literally immortalized yourself by building such a platform. So congratulations and thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, my story is an interesting one. I, uh, just so that we, we set the, the ground rules. I, I'm, I wasn't born with a silver spoon. I wasn't even born with a spoon at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not from an, an uh, uber elite family. I'm not from a rich home. Um, I grew up in a small township in, in Ghana called Doma mm -hmm. Um, You could walk the length and breadth of the town in 30 minutes. In 30 minutes? Yes, you That's can. Also the town it's is. a very small township. It's open, it has villages around it, but the town itself, you could go up and down in 30 minutes. Sure. Um, my dad wasn't around much, so it was me and mom. Um, and here's where I give a shout out to all super moms. Sure, I'm shout a, out to the moms, eh? I'm a, I'm a mommy's boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the basics was mom. Mom built the basics. We were in what, at that time, I, I was born in the 90s. At that time, I could classify our township as a village, right? It was, it was, we didn't have a traffic light. I had never seen a swimming pool before. The, mm. the televisions were black and white. I needed to stand in somebody's window to watch it. We didn't have one. When we finally had one, you had to slap it. And then for the whole week, you might come out for two days and it will not be on again, you know? Um, but there's something mom did for me that set the basis. By age six, seven, uh, she had a few friends who lived in the city. Mm -hmm. And every time she would go to the city, she would see all these books that uh, the, the well-to-do friends' children didn't want to read. So she would then ask them, can I take them back? So my understanding of the world started being shaped from when I started reading those books. Interestingly, mm -hmm. there were no like entrepreneurship books or there were romance books. Robert. From Daniel Steele, Daniel Steele or whatever. <laughs> those were the, those 2000 page romance books, right? But and was, you were six. I was seven, six. Yeah. Um, and those were the times I started, you know, learning about horses and ranches and sunsets with orange skies. I'd never seen stuff like that. Um, they were not in my reality, right? But you had to imagine. But I had to imagine them because I was reading about them. And that's the power of reading. And maybe as we go along and I tell my story, I'll try and anchor a few learning points. There are two ways to travel. You can travel physically or you can travel cognitively. So for me, what helped me was once I started being exposed to that kind of information, it allowed my worldview to open. And there was something to look forward to because then I knew out there 
there were horses, there were ranches, there were sunsets, there were beaches, there were things that I didn't have a physical relationship with, but I had a, a mental image of, right? So mm -hmm. that's where it started. Um, and then she really encouraged me always in church to get up and recite, you know, the scripture and, you know, get ahead and speak up. So mom always encouraged me. She had a bit of a charisma. She was a people's person. So she was always out there. So it encouraged me to always stand up. So by the time I was eight, nine, I was already very comfortable talking in front of people. I wasn't timid. I, we didn't have much. We didn't have money, but I was confident in, in what I had to say. I didn't care whether I was right or wrong because mom said speaking up is the most important thing, right? So for me, that's where it started from. Uh, fast forward, I then got the opportunity to leave that township, coming to the city. Uh, there's a city called no, Kumasi. Akron. No, Kumasi. Kumasi, yeah. Um, and so that's when things started changing because now a lot of the things I had a mental image of, I could see them. And how old are you at the time? At this time, I'm 10 years old. But well, you moved with mom. Moved with mom you. has traveled. Yeah. Um, and so I've moved with I've, I've moved to stay with mom's best friend. Mom has gone out to look for greener pastures to help. Um, I don't know if I want to talk about this, but at this point, we've just found out that I have about six step siblings. Uh, yes. On your dad's side. No, you're on that on that other side. On that yeah. side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so mom. I'm twenty, baby. Oh so my God. <laughs> Okay, dad, you, you're padding, you're not 20. Got 20, Ooh. 20 so, siblings. Um, I come in there, I'm now in the city. I'm seeing, I tell you an interesting story. The first time I saw traffic, I didn't know what it was because in where I was coming from, wherever you saw five, six, seven cars come next to each other and honing, it was a way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So now I come into the city and I see this long drive of cars. I look at the woman sitting next to me and I ask, whose wedding is this? Why are we going to this wedding? It's like, what why is it such a big wedding? It wasn't a big wedding. All those cars going for the wedding. It's like, no, it's not a wedding. It's called traffic. I'm like, huh? Right? Because the number of cars in my town, you could count them. There was never traffic. What the hell is my concept of traffic was not there. Um, and then at that point, the, the reading habit was already established. So I came, we had a different tongue. Uh, we have very different languages in Ghana, actually. So uh, even though we spoke a certain type of Akan, right? It's called Chi. Mm. But what we spoke in that part of the world where I came from was different from what they spoke in the city. It was different variations of Akan. But they used to mock at ours because there's a particular sound in our kind of Chi. The, the, uh, the, the consistent sound is the sound that uh, sheep make, bear. Right. We mm -hmm. use that a lot in our language. So there was a lot of mockery in that. So I decided the best way to go so they don't laugh at my so they don't laugh at my tongue is perfect my English. So I'm gonna only speak English and I'm gonna speak it properly so I can intimidate them. So Are you making the decision at what age? This is like ten. At ten because stuff. yeah, ten is still ten going into eleven because I'm in the city. These these people come to school with cars. The girls make their hair. I've never seen that before. It's like, like an international school of sorts, right? Sure. So this is like high level for me. And they're laughing when I speak Chi, which is our local language. So, okay, I'm going to go to English because mm -hmm. I did realize mm -hmm. that, that there was also a little bit of a deficiency with how they spoke English, right? Yeah. So then I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit at this time without Google or any of those things. So it's dictionaries and encyclopedias. So I'm going to chew the words. That's the term we use. I'm going to chew them. I'm going to memorize them. That's that is. And I'm going to speak stuff that they don't understand. Every time I speak, they need to look for the dictionary. So that was my idea at a very young age. So I started reading profusely. I started reading ferociously. I was consuming words, looking for vocabulary, at least three words every day and find a way to apply it in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, with time, I was becoming popular in school because I was a brilliant chap because again, mom introduced me to reading very early. Very I got yeah. a break from that. So you were interested. I was very interested and I had so much to say because yeah. I knew about this. And you that. can talk about wrenches you've it, never it, seen. It, exactly, <laughs> right? So. You know, so now people were gravitating towards me. I became class captain. I was first in class. If I become second, I'm crying. I need to be first. I'm going for a remark. Somebody didn't give me something. I was that type of kid. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I went to stand for school prefect. In fact, they, they forced us. During our time, our class group was so stubborn 
nobody wanted to run. So the school said the first and second position, men, first and second position, women, are going to be boys preferred and assistants, boys preferred, and then girls preferred and assistant. So because I was first, I was forced to be uh, the school prefect. Problem is, I'm now getting into town life, right? So I've, I've been a bit influenced by peer pressure. So I'm a stubborn boy. I don't want to wear white socks. I don't want to come to school on time. And I tell them, I don't want to do this. And they're like, nope, you're first. You're going to do it. They put me in a school prefect. I was school prefect for two weeks. <laughs> I was the first guy <laughs> to be school prepared and devoted <laughs> in the history of the school. Because you didn't follow the rules. I say didn't show up for nothing. When you're school prepared, you're the guy who's supposed to lead the assembly, let them sing the national anthem, give the announcements. I show up to school when everybody is in class. You know what's interesting about your story um, that I'm picking up as you're telling it? It is said that you influence a child in the first seven years of their life. That's it. Right. And after that, there's barely anything that you, you can, can do. do Absolutely. Right? And even the Bible that you and I read says, train up a child. The way he should if, go. And then and when he, he grows up, he never depart from there. Absolutely. So mom put in those disciplines yep. in you as a kid. Yep. And then when you look back now as an international speaker, yep. as a CEO, yep. as a businessman, yep. someone who's doing amazing things, how do you correlate that to how you grew up then? You have picked up arguably the most important our foundation to my growth and my journey and my story is that Maron instilled the most important principles in my life at the time where I was still malleable, at the time I was still programmable. Because the idea is when we're at that age, I don't really remember, so I hope the fat checkers don't come for me. I think our brain is in theta. That's what they call it. Mm. And so we learn by observing. So we see what we see is what we model. And that's what mom did. Mom didn't only instruct, he modeled. He was always reading his Bible. So I always read my Bible. And as I grew, I really departed from life with God for a very long time. But inside, very deep, there was an anchor that was always pulling me back. Like, hey, you're very far away from home, eh? Come back. This, this is not you. And all of that can be traced back to those initial things. Uh, I give a lot. I do a lot of charity work. That's mom. Mom will give the last food we have, then come in and come and pray to God and mm. say God will provide. And two hours later, somebody will show up and come and give us food, twice what we had that she had just given out. So when I was growing up, given was a function of the needs of other people and how I felt in my spirit. It was not a function of abundance. I have never been given because I had a lot more. True. That's because I saw it modeled. Every single trace of virtue that I see in me, the foundation was what mom laid for me. That, that's where the secret is. And then of course, because the anchor was all God, you never go wrong with him. You know, so that's where I can trace everything back to. Yeah. So I see also it made you an inquisitive person. Extremely. And you do a lot of self-study as Absolutely. well. You said on Saturday that you learned from the university of YouTube. Of YouTube. Yeah. Um, how did that translate into the love for technology and the love to, I mean, you, you are futuristic yeah. only yeah. after all. Yeah. To look at things from a futuristic point of view and say, I want to build for the future. I want to build for the next generation. And I want to be the guy that really introduces and ushers society Absolutely. into things that are coming. Okay, so when I was coming up, um, I hated status quo. Something about status quo bothered me. Mm. Something about the statement, this is how we've always done it, yeah. really, really bothered me. Because what I realized is once you took that um, notion, it stopped you from further progress. They stop you from growing. Um, I have a book called Einstein on Defect. Yeah, you've written eight books. <laughs> Forgot to mention that. Eight books I, you've written. I have also. a book called Einstein on Defect. And you don't Defect. even have a university degree. No, I don't. Oh. <laughs> we'll get into this. <laughs> I have a book called Einstein on Defect, How Yesterday's Success. Einstein on Defect. Yeah. How Yesterday's Success Could Guarantee Tomorrow's Failure. Hmm. 
Yes. Because get into that. So this is the idea. Uh, whenever you have a way, you've always done things and it succeeded. If you are not still thinking outside the box, it stops you from innovating. So for instance, this is how you've always recorded your podcast. Mm. So this is the set way you've done it and you've achieved success. You're happy with that, right? But now there are far more or far less expensive gadgets. Uh, there is a way you can shoot a green screen and you can use AI to prop up any kind of studio. Yep. But because this is how you've always done it and you're comfortable with this, it has stopped you from bringing in a far more efficient, far more cheaper and far more easier way of doing it and achieving even better results. Mm -hmm. That's a clear example. So oftentimes the enemy of best is good. Oh, we good. This is how we've always done it. It always works for us. It's great. That's the problem. If you look at how disruption happens, disruption happens when the incumbent becomes comfortable and says, this is how we've always done it. This is how it's always worked and we're going to be good. When somebody suggests that within the BlackBerry company, research in motion and said that we need to do away with the quality keyboard and give people more screen, they said, you must be crazy. They love us because of quality. Yeah. And then iPhone showed up and said, why are we wasting all this space with hardware when the keyboard could pop up when they need it and disappear when they don't, and they have more screen for entertainment. So that's innovation. Blue Blackberry out of the water. Yeah. So what is your relationship with innovation, especially as an African doing business globally? And also speaking to the mindset that you have that young people can borrow from. Well. Absolutely. Um, this is my, I tell you, let me answer that question and connect it to this innovation one. This is my story to technology. I was forced into it. So I was bothered by status quo. And so I, I was always looking for the next thing. Okay, this is a trend, what's next? Because very, very young, I realized the people that made life transforming generational wealth always did it when they were first in a new trend, when they were first in new industries, new revolutions. So if you look at the first industrial revolution, the guys that built the steam engines made all the money. Look at the second industrial revolution, the guys that owned the factories and the assembly lines made all the money. If you look at the third industrial revolution, which is computing, we can at least refer to Bill Gates, Bill Gates Intel, Steve or Jobs. Those Steve Jobs. Yeah. Then when you come into social, which then led us into the fourth industrial revolution, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, this is Facebook, this is Twitter. Those guys made all the money. So I realized sustainable wealth was built when you were able to get ahead and be able to detect the innovation at the edge and be positioned before. So when everybody was catching up, they would come and meet you in that new field. So that's how my thinking was, but I didn't know how to practicalize it. Interestingly, Bitcoin forced me into it. I make the story very short. A friend reaches out to me, asked to borrow money. The money he wanted to borrow is the equivalent of about $40 today. Yeah. This was in 2013. He was a guy who used to work online. I knew what he used to do was a bit mischievous. I do not like issues that have yeah, to do, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't like issues that have to do with police. Those are three places I hate. I hate police. I hate hospitals. I hate morgues. I don't like it. The center hospitals kill me. When I'm sick, leave me at home. Don't take me to the hospital. I'll die earlier than my time. Right. And I don't like courts. I don't like police. So I like to do my stuff very diligently. He says to me, uh, I need a loan of 500 CDs. Ghanaians will understand this. I said, okay, um, I'll give it to you. You pay it back. He said, oh, by the way, I have abandoned Bitcoin. At that time, Bitcoin was worth nothing. They used to uh, use it to buy credit cards, online people's credit cards, which was illegal. So I said, you want to put me in jail, don't you? You're going to give me this money. Then FBI will track everybody's device and they will find it on my device and I'm going to jail. Keep your Bitcoin, a hundred Bitcoin you wanted to give me. I like your, your, yes, yes. That's exactly what forced me into futurism. So 2013, I don't take it. I didn't even get my 500 CDs back. 2017, 2016, Bitcoin is now 17,000 going 19,000. 100 Bitcoin will be 1.7 million. I had a funeral in my soul for like two years. I can imagine. That's what forced me to technology. In peace. How did I not understand? Why what did I not, thing was. why did I not give it the time? Why did I not do the due diligence? Why didn't I at least reset for myself so that I understood and could make a decision for myself? And I just assumed based on what his use 
of the technology was that it was illegal and missed out on what could have been my first breakthrough in terms of wealth. Yeah, because when you look at Bitcoin, I think about a year or two ago, it was almost a million rands. So it went to $69,000 all-time yeah. high. That's more than a million rands. Yes, sir. That's the case. Yes, sir. It's so currently it, just hit 41000 this morning. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's almost a million even now. Thank you. So that would have been giving you a hundred million, million rands. Yes, yes. And I didn't take it. Free. And I didn't get my 500 CDs back. I'm still looking for you, by the way, wherever you are. <laughs> I, he just left. He left Ghana, said he was going to the UK. He had a bunch of those. So he had Bitcoin. So whoever he is, is a multi, multi. No, he's gone. I hope he didn't sell everything. He's gone. He's okay, wherever he is. So after that experience. I and he wanted to leave you a gift. He wanted to give me, like, just hold on to this. Like, I have a lot of it. It's worth, like, I think at that time it was worth, like, the equivalent of the money he wanted to take. So, you know, just hold this and I'll send you, I'll give you your money when I, when I, uh, when I have it. I so then that forces you into wanting to study and now understand. I need to understand every technology that is coming next because I've missed blockchain. So what is next? That's what pushed me into futurism. So I literally went online and I Googled how to know technologies of the future. And then I saw futurism as an academic study. And I said, I'm going to pursue it. And that's how I started my journey into committing myself to voracious research, reading, experimentation, get into the technology. If you can afford it, buy the prototype, use it. I was one of the people who tested out ChatGPT when it was 1.5, mm -hmm. version 1.5. Yes. So after that Bitcoin experience, it was all in or nothing. Because at that point, I also understood that at this point in our lives till we die, and the generations after us forever. Technology would be part of our operating system forever. And so if I took a bet on technology, it was one of the best bets that I could take. That's why I jumped head on. And that's the results you're seeing now. How do you think young Africans should now start positioning themselves for any future tech, for current technologies that are happening and, and with future trends as well that you see? I mean, we've got young people from different places, Ghana, Kenya, Zambia, South Africa, yep. and some are within the deep rurals without internet, without any access to any form of technology that would be discussing now. Absolutely. So for those of us that do have access to it, how do we then breach that gap? And how does a young person who's listening to you now then put themselves in the position where they can see into the future? I'm going to look in the camera and say this to any young person watching me. If you have access to Google today, please pay attention. If you have access to Google today, you have access to more information than Bill Clinton did when he was president of the United States of America. That's my boggling. If you have access to Google, you have access to more. I'm not talking classified. I'm talking information, even classified. So the idea is our people first need to understand the utility of what we have, the advantage and the privilege of what we have as tech. Mm. Guy, before you and I couldn't do this and get direct access to audience. Yeah. We need a middleman. We need a television. We needed radio and it cost an arm and a leg. So we couldn't broadcast any value without the middleman. Sure. When the internet showed up, it disrupted the middleman. Destroyed the gatekeepers. It totally destroyed the gatekeepers. Yeah. Joe Rogan is probably doing more numbers on his podcast than CNN. Sure. Think about that for a moment. And CNN has been there for a very long time. This is what I'm saying to you. The power that we have now because of technology allows, I literally call it the one man thousand effect. While one thousand effect. One man, one, one man thousand. One man. One man yeah. thousand effect. Yes. It means one man can have the effect of a thousand people. We didn't realize it. How many followers do you have on Instagram? Mm, like 17,000. 17,000. 100, 120,000 on Facebook. Pause. Which stadium? in this country can house 120,000 people. None. That's how many people are following you. It's become so normal, we do not even realize the kind of gold we're holding. 
as you sit here, if you figure out a way mm. to plug value that 10% of your crowd will be willing to pay for at $1 per month, you have $12,000 per month waiting to happen on your Facebook every month. If my math is right, that's about $144,000 a year if you can serve 10% of that crowd. Think about that for a moment. It was never possible. Yes. You alone have 120,000 people following you. This is the power we have. Yes. So the first thing is young people need to understand the privilege and the system of advantage that this thing called technology is. Secondly, they need to go back. This is why I always push for people to study anthropology and history. Anthropology is the study of beginning of things and history is the study of the past. If you understand anthropology and history, you would understand that we have in this season, again, the greatest advantage ever mm -hmm. compared to any other generation. So if you understand why the internet was created and what it was created for, and you decide to use it for that, you know, they've said that a lot of us use about 10% of the capabilities of our phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, don't, we don't use everything, myself included. We're wasting it. Yeah. My entire business exists on my phone. Mm. I move my, my company is run like a beehive. There's only one country in the world I have an office and that's for bookings. All my companies, they all sit in different places. Most of my workers work, work in boxer shops. I don't need you to show up to the office, deliver the work. And that's it. And that's it. I heard you say you've got a young person that edits all your videos on a phone. On a phone, 21 year old girl sitting in Lagos, Nigeria, earning about $1,400 from me and seven other clients that I have recommended. She's not done with the university. So with AI, going back to what you're saying, destroying all these jobs, right? Uh, in the sense that, like you said, one industry, like the helicopter guy yep. and the camera guy yep. would be destroyed by the drone, yep. which has happened, yep. right? How does emotional intelligence now play a role in, in industries like that? So, so for the young person watching, thinking, oh, snap. I yeah. can be destroyed by AI. Yes. How does their capacity to develop their emotional intelligence and ethics then put them in a position where they could still be ahead? So here is how you do it practically. First, be plugged into the matrix. I'm going to use that word. I don't yeah. mean get plugged into senseless consumption. I mean, plug into what's happening. Know the technologies that are coming, know what they can do. Be aware of them and as much as you can test them out as early as possible, right? Practically. Secondly, build skills that are easy to update. Let me tell you how I have applied this to my life, specifically in public speaking. 10 years ago, I was speaking about Facebook marketing, Instagram marketing, Twitter marketing. It was new. It was fresh. There was knowledge asymmetry. People didn't know what to do. So I went in there. I studied. I learned. I applied. I executed. I failed. I succeeded. And I brought that and I sold it to other people. When people started getting the gist of it, I jumped from that. And I moved into full on digital marketing, which was different from social media. Because with digital, you were now looking at search engine optimization. You were looking at uh, a paid media, uh, PPCs. You were running a, a, a cost per clicks, campaigns that had to do with Google, YouTube, really being able to deliver ads to eyeballs. So I was now fully in there. Again, it was new. It was fresh. There was knowledge asymmetry. People didn't know what to do. I, was, I went in there. I studied. I researched. I experimented. I failed. I succeeded. I sold it. Mm. When I realized people were moving in there, my Bitcoin epiphany had happened. So I switched, went into futurism and started picking on topics that would be necessary. So I studied future of banking and started talking to banks about blockchain and digital only banks and how they should pay, pay attention. I looked at future of work and anybody who was interested in employment was going to need me. I looked at future of government, governance and I started telling governments what should, should they should do. I looked at future of education. And so what I have done is every single time I jump in to the fresh body of knowledge, the fresh industry, the fresh technology, 
And guess the four things I do. I research, I study, I implement, I experiment, I fail, I finally get it. Then I take the body of knowledge that I've gathered from that entire process and I sell it. And you make money from it. And I make money from that. And you're doing all of that without having gone to varsity. Was that a conscious decision or you just didn't have money? So to I was in varsity. Yeah. I went to university. I went to University of Ghana. I was there for four years. However, at that time, I had already seen what technology was going to do. By the way, never drop out or don't joke with education. It's so important. Yeah. Now, the thing was, I had already figured out what technology was doing. And I had already started making money with it, right? Sure. And then I looked at my lectures. <laughs> I'm not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I need the guys I want to look like. <laughs> And I was like, wait, there was something wrong somewhere. Something is off, yeah. You know, this is the person impacting the knowledge that's supposed to help me create wealth. The question is, are they supposed to give you information that's helping you to create wealth? <laughs> so, I didn't pay too much attention in school. So by the time I realized I was out there building my businesses, running around, at that time I was in a bit of entertainment. So I was organizing parties and events and taking artists on tour. I've worked with a lot of these big names that you see. I, I probably can give you pictures to show for it. I've worked with Whiskey, Burner Boy, Mafia Kizolo, um, at those times, Ice Prince, DeVito. I work with a lot of those guys, the Ghanaian Sarkozy, a lot of those guys. I was in university then. So by doing these things, making money from it and enjoying it so much, I was missing out on some of the tests back in school. And then what happens is we have a system where if you fail, you can reset the thing that you fail. But yeah, I didn't even get the first one. You think I want to reset? Again, I, I felt like I had figured it out. It could have gone terribly wrong for me. But mm. what had helped me was that thing that mom helped me build. Even though I wasn't getting my education in the classroom, I was not not being educated. You were getting an education elsewhere getting education anyway. Anywhere. Yeah. I was learning on the go. I was now getting into the room with powerful people. I was asking the right questions, receiving mentorship directly and indirectly. I was on YouTube, downloading videos, watching them, uh, applying the things I was learning. Now books were coming in the ebooks, so you can have you can have them on the internet. Downloaded a ton of PDF books that I started reading. I remember reading Rich Dad Poor Dad seven times in I think a year and a half or two years. Huh. Just trying to understand wealth quadrants, just trying to understand how money worked, uh, 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 how nations are made, uh, the wealth of nations, uh, the men that built Africa. Then I got interested in the men that built America. Then I got interested in documentaries. I started watching documentaries. I started understanding history. I started understanding uh, hieroglyphics, how Egyptians had some kind of secret knowledge that belonged you know, uniquely to the people of Africa, how we were kings and queens, how Mansa Musa was so rich, he could go to a region and actually change the GDP of that region because of how much gold he was traveling with. How in Ghana, we were so self-sufficient, we used to supply light to Burkina Faso and some of the neighboring countries. And the time where one Ghana cities was one dollar in equivalent, one Ghana city was one pound in equivalent. And so this like volume of knowledge altered the way that I thought. So even though I did not complete university, I did four years in university, but I didn't get the certificate. Yeah. I was educated enough to still bring value to the marketplace. Sure. And the marketplace responds to value. They don't respond to CV and they don't respond to degree. That's the reason why your CV might get you in, but your incompetence will take you out. Will take you out. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So tell me, when you look at uh, the state of African leadership, do you think it can produce enough young people that think the way you do? Or should young people just take it upon themselves and lead themselves? The problem... Because not everybody at the... I know I've, I was raised by mom as well alone. Some of the lessons I have and the stuff I do now in business, I know they were installed back then. Yeah. Right? But I also know that not everybody had the privilege of a focused mother. Yeah. And then now the question is, if you don't have the privilege of that, they're at the mercy of of basically the leadership of yeah. that country yeah. one way or another. Yeah. So when you look at the state of leadership from Cape to Cairo, yeah. in my opinion, I don't think they've got what it takes to produce a I, thousand Kwamis. I will borrow Vuzi's words. Our problem on the continent is we think politicians are leaders. Mm. Those are two different things. So there are no leaders, basically. By their fruits, you know them. Mouse Monroe said, 
the quality of a citizenry is dependent on the quality of leadership. In fact, this is exactly what he said. He was speaking about kingdoms. The pride of a king is the quality of life of its citizenry. That's leadership. A man said leadership is measured in men who grow trees, the shades of which they will not get to sit under. Yeah. In Dubai, they have a policy. Before the government approves anything that they're going to spend on, the minister or the leader who's proposing it needs to show that that thing they're proposing will still be in effect and will be able to benefit people 30 years after they are dead. Otherwise, the government doesn't approve it. So you want us to build this? Okay, proof that if we build this, it will benefit the current generation. And 30 years after you are dead, it will still be able to benefit the generation that is coming. If you can prove that sustainability for that thing, we will go ahead and sponsor and pay for it. That's how Dubai developed. So yeah. the answer is no. At the current crop of leadership who are mentoring the next crop of leadership, who are the shadow of what the next crop of leadership are it's looking at, look like we're finished. So we owe it to ourselves as young people. So yourself as in you as an individual. As in you and I owe it to ourselves yeah. to pick up the reins. Guys, it is, it's got to go to the level of I am responsible for myself. So many things have happened that I've proven to you that they don't care that much about you. They mm, don't. So there's data. There's data to prove that you're on your own. So if you're still living in the bubble of it's going to get right, oh, jobs will come, oh, opportunities will avail themselves, you're living in self-delusion. So there's a certain level of self-accountability, self-responsibility. You need to get sick and tired of the situation for yourself. Look out there and say, what are my options? If I never get employed ever again, what are my options? If the government never gives me a loan for my business, what are my options? Because that's where the power of technology comes in. It gives you alternatives. The problem is, and they might not like me for this, a lot of our young people are lazy. They have a sense of entitlement. They want to be spoon fed. I put videos on my Instagram and TikTok. Here is how you can use ChatGPT to create a business from scratch. Here is how you can use ChatGPT to read 10 books in 10 minutes. I have videos like this, real videos. Yeah. And I have people come in there and say, where can we find ChatGPT? Oh, here are uh, 10 books that changed my life. Those videos are there. People come in there and where say- Where can I find the books? I was telling Vuzi yesterday, I think there are more jobs ready for people than there are people ready for jobs. Ready for jobs. Yeah, the problem is not a shortage of jobs. No, sir. The problem is lack of competency. How do we instill that mindset then in young people? What do you and I and the next person watching this who's got the same vision that we have then start instilling it? Because I think that's what the biggest problem in Africa is. That inability to take something and translate it into value. The problem is with unwilling vessels. Have you heard the quote, you can take the horse to the river, but you, you cannot can force, force it, it to, to drink? drink. That's the problem. There's one guy, yeah. one guy, businessman, yeah. owns an insurance company. So I'm sitting with him. We're talking about the state of black people. Then he looks at me and says, witness, I'm done saving black people. Yeah. I'm saving myself. I am done. I, I was just going there. I'm just up to here with them. Yeah, yeah. And I'm about to conclude that black people are cursed people. I... That broke my heart. It's unfortunately we're, we're, we're some of the most blessed, if not the most blessed race ever. And I'm not racist. Of course. But of course we are. We are so... So, you can take the horse to the river. You can force it to drink. We're doing our best. I organized conferences in universities just beginning of this year. I spent top dollar from my pocket. Some yeah. sponsored. No government agency. No company came on board. 16 universities, I reached 18,000 children and they were more interested in item 13 than the stuff I wanted to give them that could change their life. Item 13, what is that? Item 13 in Ghana is food and drinks, refreshment. So uh -huh. if you do a conference and you don't assure them that item 13 will be present, they will not come. So I recently did a, a conference as well. So I've done an 18 
18 city tour yeah. across the country. Yeah. And then recently I've had people sponsor me and say, go to the township. Yeah. Then there's a township called Alexander. Okay. So I've done conferences, Cape Town, Johannesburg, Durban, oh. affluent places. Yes. Then we did something in Alex. Yes. My heart broke. You would, yeah, you will. Young people did not come. No, they won't. The people that didn't need the stuff are the ones, sharing, that, are the ones that were sharing. Yes, up. please. That's the problem. The guy has a job. The guy has a business. That's, that's trying to come in. That's the guy that's coming. That's the reason why poverty is not a lack of currency. Poverty is a mindset. It's a state of mind. Our people are poor at heart. Isn't it interesting that for you to be able to determine the future of a country, look at how they treat their entertainers and look at how they treat their thinkers. The entertainers are the kings. Whenever you look at any demographic, the fact that this podcast will receive less views than a twerk video tells you the state of our continent. The poorest people, however, and I, I, don't, I don't want to get on anybody's nerves, but I want to speak the truth. The poorest people have a problem with paying for education. Mm. They'd rather pay for entertainment. Absolutely. So a 500 round ticket to a party or a concert is not too expensive, but to your conference, you are a scammer. Definitely. <laughs> I've heard that before. You know? Yeah. So how do we do it? We're, good, we're just going to amplify the message as much as possible. And hopefully the principle of Jesus, my sheep know me, they recognize my voice and they will come. Those who the message resonates with, who are sick and tired of their situation, would actually hear what it is that they need. Guy, witness, you are a witness to the fact that if somebody never stepped in a classroom, but they had access to YouTube and they were disciplined to study two hours a day, they could get an MBA level of education in six, in four to six years. Absolutely. Enter the job market, be competent in delivering value. Okay, let me not even make it big. We have somebody at the back of the camera uh, shooting this. When we're done, let's ask him. If anybody is serious and they go online and they start searching out Adobe uh, Photoshop or mm -hmm. any of those editing softwares, and they, script and all, and all they put six months of work in it. Let's ask him if those people could not become editors we can and ask work him with him. That. Would they not be competent? And they can work with you and get paid? So what else should we do? The last thing I will say to you is Africa is very, very good at killing his profits. Can I quantify what you said? Tell me. I never asked him for a university degree when joining the business. Thank you very much. Did I? No, I just thank, asked him, are you, you good at what you do? And when That's you it. saw his first work, it was proof enough. No degree at all. No, I you never don't asked. need it. I, you, I, don't I, need I, CV, you don't need anything. You don't care how he dressed to work today. Is he delivering the work? Period. That's the important thing. Africa is amazing at killing their own profits. I look at young people and I go, you are on Twitter trolling me. Imagine. The politician that just took the money that could have come into the public pool. And to help have, you. And could have sponsored 10,000 year old businesses. Just spread it on his side check. You're not trolling him. I have gone out of the recesses of my own volume. I'm sharing it for free. Mm. Another guy you're calling a scammer. How does that work? Are you so cursed? Let me borrow the word of that man. Hmm. That you cannot see that you are now your own worst enemy. You are the very thing standing between your own progress. The people that should be your allies are the ones you're trolling. The ones that should be your enemies, they show up and you run me. And celebrate and them. And celebrate them. A politician shows up, they do a rally, 50,000 people are out there in the sun for them to tell you lies mm. and things that they would never be able to fulfill. And that's the one you show up for. This is the problem we have. So what can we do? We keep preaching the message. We don't give up. At some point, I wanted to give up. I was right at the place where our insurance uh, papa was. Yeah. I realized posterity would judge us. So what I'm going to do if this generation, VT said it and it registered for me once and for all, go back into the times of Martin Luther King. Nobody thought he was a genius. They thought he was a complete bastard. Go back to the amazing great thinkers that we extol today. During their time, they were not celebrated. You will be misunderstood when you are 
the one preaching the message of progress in your generation. You'll be hated, you'll be trolled, you'll be misunderstood. People would misrepresent your thoughts, your ideas and concepts. It's fine. A generation will come that will pick that body of work and it would give them some value. So for me, if nobody gets any form of value from all the things I'm doing now, I'm okay with it. I'm leaving it for posterity. Legacy will speak for me when I'm gone. That's all we can do. Mm. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I'm blown. And I hope you guys that are sitting at home watching this are getting a lot of value from it. I know I am. So I want to ask you, as a Ghanaian looking out into South Africa, yeah. what do you see? Ooh. You know when Jesus healed that guy from yeah. blindness yeah, yeah, and yeah. asked him, what do you, what see? Do you see? First uh, that I see it, people looking like trees. So if you see people <laughs> as trees, you chop them down, don't you? Uh, let me be politically correct. <clears throat> no, uh. be politically incorrect. <laughs> we want the truth. Don't mess our feelings. Um, Tell us. Our people, what I see in South Africa is you guys have what we don't have in the West. You have infrastructure. I was telling Hetty, if I got half the support she got for her event in the events I do in Ghana, yeah. I will do twice or three times the amount of events I do. And you fill up domes. Every year, yes. So you guys have such an amazing advantage. We can look at the negatives and positives of a credit system. But that's another thing. When I purchased my first car, I, I purchased it cash. In my country, it's cash and carry. If you see me live in a house, cash. cash. That's why the Nigerians act the way they act. Yeah. We speak the language of cash. Yeah. You guys have credit systems. Yeah. So if you build a discipline and you build credit, you're able to access liquidity for a few things. We don't have it. When I look in South Africa, I look at a people with such rich history and the opportunity for such a bright future, but we're still so caught on. Please forgive me if I hurt anybody's wounds, but we're still so caught on to the past that we can leap forward. I have no position whatsoever to speak about apartheid. I, I, I have no connection to it. We were colonized. Gold Coast, Ghana was a place where they used to ship the slaves. I can relate to colonization, but I cannot say I understand apartheid. But at some point, we've got to be able to put our past in perspective and let it inform our future. And we've got to some way, somehow, I'm not saying forget it. Mm. I'm not saying you don't seek retribution or restitution for it. I'm saying if you're so caught on to the past, you might never be able to leap on. To the future. Do you know that the first experiment to connect the human brain to the internet was done here in South Africa? Was done in Vicks University. Mm. That's the capacity we have. When I look at South Africa, I look at a gold mine waiting to be dug. I look at the people who, if they could focus their energies in the right place, could become the model template for the continent. Unfortunately, that's not what it looks like. Outsiders now are free to come here because we hear that our own brothers don't like us here. Mm. We hear that there are all forms of uh, attacks. And, and I'm like, you're attacking your own brother? Someone that looks exactly like you. We should be working together. Mm. In fact, Africa was one land. We are the Kushites. It's the, it's it's the the is one land. We, Look at us. <laughs> we are the same. It's because somebody, an invisible hide. Tell you the truth, you look like one of my uncles, Thomas Baloy. I'm telling you. <laughs> we're no different. We're no different, Gavin. If you go to Kiani, you're Tom Gavin. So that's what I see in South Africa. I see hope. I see the, the potential for us to have a template for our continent. The African Renaissance is so possible with Africa. You have such a rich history. Mm. You have minerals. You have a beautiful land. We have rich, colorful culture. You have everything the continent could model. 
you have everything then as we model and become self-sufficient that the world could then respect us. Unfortunately, we're so caught up in the past. We're so caught up in our feelings and we're just not moving. You know what we need? A vision. Like if I was to ask any South African today, what is South Africa's vision? None of them can tell you. I was in Kenya before I came here. I got on the stage and I asked them, every single region in the world has a plan for Africa. I've seen the Saudi Arabian policy for Africa, the US African policy, the UK African policy, the UAE African policy. What's Africa's policy for the world? In fact, what's Africa's policy for itself for Africa? Hmm. That's the problem. That's the problem. It's a, it's a self-perpetuating system that keeps churning out garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. Without a vision, the people the perish. People perish. It's as simple as that. The people perish. So you're right. We need a shared vision. It needs to be sustainable. It needs to be outside of party colors. It needs to be continental, then nationalistic, mm. then community, then family, than individual. That's how we will solve the problem. All right. So that camera there <laughs> is for you. And okay, that's the other one. You are one of the best speakers, arguably, that I've heard, you know, Humble. across Africa, probably across the world. And I do know that you have a heart for Africans and to see them prosper. The fact that you took your time to come and sit here yeah. because you really want to impact somebody, even Absolutely. if it's one person. Absolutely. You know, what would you say to that young person who's lost hope right now, looking into that camera? He's looking at you and he's saying, Kwame, I hear you guys are speaking from a position of privilege. You know that <laughs> those words are so privileged right now. I know. Whenever somebody says something, they're like, ah, witness, you're speaking from a position of privilege. privilege. Yeah. What would you say to them? Look, I, I know what it means to lose hope. I've been there. Um, I know what it means to not know where the next meal is going to come from. It might not look like it now, but I've been there. I slept uh, on the floor of my cousin's hall for close to three months because I couldn't afford rent. So trust me when I say I know what it feels like. At that time, I was hardworking. I was putting in work. I just wasn't getting the results because I was not part of the political elite. I wasn't connected. I didn't have any network. But the problem with hopelessness is that it's an abuse of everything that you have within you, your gifts, your talents, your skills. I don't care about religion. I don't care what you believe in, but it would be an insult to your creator to give up on everything he has deposited in you. What I want to say to you is give it one last try and tell yourself, if that doesn't work, you will give it one last try. This is not motivational fluffy stuff. The way that the world is built, the world is built to reward resilience, problem solving, and those who overcome challenges. That's how they taught you, but you forgot it. You went to school, you were in grade one, you overcame the test of grade one. And when you passed, you went to grade two. You are just about to give up where you should be focusing on passing the test so you can go to the next level. What would giving up give you? All I need you to do, be sick and tired of where you are and ask yourself, what are my options? and apply yourselves to ruthless execution until you get the desired result. Let me say that again. Apply yourself to ruthless execution until you get the desired results. That's where you will thank yourself for not giving up. I understand hopelessness. I've been there. I've been hungry. I've been broke. I've been despised. <sighs> You're not alone. You're not alone. Get back to work. 
that's where the magic happens. Cheers. And what's the one thing that they should do tomorrow morning? When you wake up in the morning, pick up your phone if you have access to the internet, open the storehouse of wealth called YouTube, and search the one thing that you've always wanted to learn how to do, whether that's how to make perfumes, how to start a business from scratch, how to be a video editor, how to be a public speaker, how to start a podcast. Search for that how-to. Watch the first five videos that come. Thank me later. That's what you can do tomorrow morning. <laughs> Kwame, it's lovely having you here, Thank brother. Thank you so much for having me. This conversation was so good, I didn't realize time was I'm just looking at the time. Like, That's oh the only reason I'm cutting it, because I know <laughs> I took probably 30 more minutes of your time. And I'm like, I can't cut it this short. This man is so good. And, and young people are benefiting so much from yeah. this man, because I don't know when again we would be Absolutely. able to sit like this you know Absolutely. there's a reverend um a revivalist his name is leonard revenue right he says the opportunity of a lifetime mm. must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity absolutely you right. know so i felt like this was an amazing opportunity for us to yeah. get you to speak more specifically to young south africa absolutely you know so i said to vusi as well yesterday he said witness we should do something yeah. and i said yes we should because and we should do it as a collective yeah. because perhaps if somebody doesn't like witness, maybe they like Vusi. Exactly. If they don't like Vusi, maybe they like witness. But, yep. If they don't like witness, maybe they like someone else. Exactly. You know, and, and that's what we want to do, you know, Absolutely. to spread the message. Oh, I feel like we're doing God's work. We are. You and I are doing God's work. We are. And, and may God amplify your message. May God bless you. And may God bring more increase. In Jesus' name. And, and give you more influence. In Jesus' name. We appreciate you, brother. Thank we appreciate you your work. Thank you. And thank you so me. much for educating us. Thank you. And that is for, that it that heart was quite many features. The features <laughs> quite many guys. If you're not blown away, I don't know what else is gonna blow you away. I don't want to add anything or subtract anything to the message. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please click on the subscribe button, click on the notification bell, share this video, you know. That's the only way that you can support uh, this podcast and this YouTube uh, YouTube channel. And that's the only way we can continue to bring you amazing people that are going to impact your lives now. That's it from me and my team broadcasting from Johannesburg, South Africa. It's more than just money. See you again next week. Ciao, ciao.